All right, well, let's go ahead and get our thing rolling here. There's an angel just got his wings. Well, welcome everybody to our uh, Carl Hess Club, the first of uh, 2013. So I trust everybody had a, a wonderful holiday uh, season. So Happy New Year. <coughs> Here we are. So uh, to start off, as usual, I'll just make a few quick house announcements, uh, generally related to our upcoming programs. Next month we will have Howard Hinman talking about discovering the secrets of energy, what the powers that were do not want you to know. And then in March we'll have Lawrence Goldberg on investing in and for the future. April is Craig Huey. Uh, May is George McCaleb. And in June we'll have Terry Brussel. So that's coming up. So keep an eye on your e announcements and e-minders. And then uh, the usual reminder that afterwards we'll have our after meeting at uh, the Doubletree. And I think everybody here knows how to get there. And our guest speaker and will find his way over there. So we'll look forward to seeing everybody, I hope, can make it this time. Most of you know of, uh, know of George, and, and several of us here know George for many years. We're acquaintances of long standing, or you know, all the way to, to being close associates and good friends. One of the great TV writers. One of he's, the great TV writers. Um, you know, I guess it, you'd, you'd say he's in that classic uh, era of, of television and film writing. Don't forget that it was a story of George's. It was made into um, the iconic Rat Pack film of all time, Ocean's Eleven. Mm -hmm. And I, film. Yeah, I, thought, I, I forgot Ocean's to add film. Oh. Yes. And, oh, the uh, one with and then, of course, and the rat, real rat pack his uh, no, I, I know. collaboration I with... That's one of my very favorite With um, William F. Nolan on Logan's Run, of course, was made into a, another really a cult film, yeah. which is very popular and spawned a television series. And uh, so he's had a definite impact on our, our culture. For those of us who are culture mavens, you know, we're oh, yes, on the Logan's uh, nostalgia Run. channels on cable and stuff. I was a big Logan's Run fan as a kid. Yes, Love we were. I had the soundtrack. I bought the LP soundtrack, which I played a lot. Were you a runner at the cons? <laughs> a lot of people were, got into it. I remember the TV show as well. Well, uh, we may hear a little bit about that, although it's, it's not necessarily meant to be the focus of our program here tonight, because George is such a multifaceted guy. He's much more than just a writer, I would say. Uh, pardon me, my opinion, but um, he's, he's someone who is a, a personality who I, I remember him telling me one time years ago, you might not remember this, but you probably will, that... Um, you had a habit, of, if I may paraphrase you to some degree, I guess, you got a habit of, of um, experiencing life on maybe ten tracks at a time and just drinking in experiences and then being able to express them in imaginative ways through writing, one of his ways. And, of course, I mentioned uh, that something that was maybe lesser known among even science fiction fans was... Um, his beat era coffee house that he um, was a partner in, uh, Cafe Frankenstein. And I don't know, I guess maybe I was the only person who attended Comic Fest last year in San Diego among our group here. But uh, Comic Fest was like a retro Comic Con. The, some of the original founders of Comic Con, who were basically Comic Con has gotten so big now that. that you know, real fans can't even get in there because of all of the Hollywood pukes and, you know, that are inhabiting it now. And my daughter's on the Well, I've, you know, I haven't been to Comic-Con in years, but it's just gotten so big that, you know, it gets sold out. So anyway, this is like a little retro type of convention, and I, I highly recommend it, and, I, and it's probably going to eventually be as popular as Comic-Con, except maybe it'll never get as big, but it was really delightful and one of the 
um, the things that I really liked about it was that um, they took care to really recreate the era and recall different aspects of people's careers, and one of them being Cafe Frankenstein. So the, uh, what served as the con suite, essentially, was um, a, a, you know, a big room that was dressed out as, you know, to, to kind of remind you of Cafe Frankenstein, which was a well, if pretty I good venue. Yeah, please, if, if jump I may, in there. Uh, yeah, I'm, but I was a kid then, I mean, very young. But uh, um, one of the things, uh, he was one of three partners in the right. venture. And the second partner was Bert Schomburg, a, a famous artist from the era. He, he did album covers for like Spirit and people like that. And, and Ringo Starr owns his uh, work and Sally Kelly and on and on. But basically, um, when he says dressed up to look like Cafe Frankenstein, really it's the artwork of Bert Schomburg yes. that was ever present. And as a matter of fact, you may not be able to see from this little picture, because it's all I have, but this is the quality of his work, and I can pass that around if you want to. He was a great artist, and, and they really made the place look just like you said, like just a yeah, It was just back. so inviting, and you just felt like hanging out there. And of course, uh, George held forth there, uh, held court, I would say, and uh, it was just delightful. Anyway, I, I highly suggest that uh, you go there next year when, when the it was at the town and country also, by the way, yeah. which is sort of a an El Cortez for the Place 20, huge, 20 teens now. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but it was just, uh, it had the right kind of seediness and threadbareness, you know, it was like, a, you just felt comfortable there, like you weren't, you know, you weren't going to scuff the walls or anything like that. So anyway, uh, by the way, let me take the opportunity to also introduce uh, Paul Johnson, uh, George's son, who is a musician and also a collaborator uh, on another one of, um, on, you know, other projects of George's, uh, mainly their, their collaboration on this um, CD that is being passed around. So I wanted to uh, admonish everyone to check well, out the table. This, you can buy this on Amazon. Yeah. Well, you, you can, and I think you can buy it right here, too. It's so only $10 here. Everything, everything um, that you see on the table there, I think, is for sale, though. So, um, really, without any further ado, I, I just want to let George, George is going to address us from where he's seated there. So since we're a small enough group, it, I think everybody will be able to hear him and see him from, from where you're seated. So uh, without any further ado, let me just uh, ask you now to uh, help me welcome George Clayton Johnson. I'm George, Paul's father. <laughs> so, uh, the thing is, when I was a little kid, six going on seven, I went to the first grade in Cheyenne, Wyoming, and uh, one day a bus was provided, and all of us little tots were taken to the Carnegie Library. And I went into the library with the other children, and I saw a big long rack of Oz books. And I was familiar with the series, although I was five, six, seven years old. And uh, so I took out one of these books and I went over to this table, set it down, sat down, and started to look at the book. And the photographer from the Cheyenne Eagle was there to greet these children and to make some kind of a fuzzy thing about these kids going to a library. And he saw me with the book, and the next thing, you know, he had taken my picture, and my picture appeared in the Cheyenne Eagle the next morning with his book and this very serious young man whose hair was neatly combed reading this book, because they were all fairly astonished. I was in the first grade, I tried to explain that I could read because my brother showed me how. And I remember cuddling up with him on a couch while he was reading The uh, Emerald City of Oz. And he started to help me and point it with his finger. And as he was reading about this king of the gnomes, who's in a terrible, angry rage, 
because he does not have his magical belt. Your magical belt. If I don't have my magical belt, I'll go crazy because Dorothy stole my magical belt and took it off to the Emerald City. By that time, I could see things like magical belt and is and da and and. And I caught on very quickly. I was a bright young boy. And I, re I, I was astonished to find my picture in the paper with my whole name, George Clayton Johnson, not a bridge. And there's this kid reading this big fat book. Well, I got so much praise, acknowledgement. Are you serious? Is that you? Yes, that's me. My picture is in the paper. This addicted me to glory. And from that time to this, I've never worked for the money. I've always worked for the glory. I want my name on the screen. I sold Ocean's Eleven to Peter Lawford for pitiful amounts of money, and everybody said, you're crazy, you could make a lot of money. But I was more interested in getting my name on the screen. And it appeared on the screen with a bunch of fancy Saul Bass credits, and I was somewhat gratified. My first sale was Ocean's Eleven. My second job was Icarus Montgolfier Wright with me sharing credit with Ray Bradbury. My third credit was The Twilight Zone with me sharing credit with Rod Serling because he bought my stories to adapt. He bought The Four of Us Are Dying and he bought uh, Execution with Albert Salmi playing the cowboy who's grabbed by the time machine out of the noose in the Old West. Yes, yeah, saw that. So, we're familiar stories, but I ended up very, very aware that there was no money in television. And for a decade there, during the 60s, I worked for television and I wrote Mr. Novak, The Law and Mr. Jones, Honey West, Star Trek, Kung Fu. What Star Trek did you do? The first one ever aired, called The Man Trap. Really? First one that was ever shown in America. They had pilots, they had several episodes already filmed, but when NBC decided to show the show, it was a very interesting thing. The Fugitive was winding down. Its last episode was scheduled, and then the next week, Star Trek would take that time slot. The NBC brass reasoned this out and went to uh, the fugitive and said, can we buy back your last hour? And that'll give you well, sufficient money to really dress up your last few episodes and put a conclusion on it with like 59 episodes instead of 60. And they all said, well, yeah, give us some money. So NBC gave them the money and now they had a blank slot one week before Star Trek was on the TV guide ready to, to appear. So that people tuning in on what they thought would be the last episode of The Fugitive would be treated to this Star Trek thing. And they had a half a dozen of them written. They had one by Jerry Soule called The Corbomite Maneuver. One by D.C. Fontana called Charlie X. They had half a dozen of them. Richard Matheson, the enemy within. But they chose the man trap. When I asked Herbert F. Solo, who was Gene Roddenberry's boss, why they did this, he said he thought it was because the opening of my show has Captain Kirk and his people step into this room and say, beam us down, Solo. And the next thing you know, they're being beamed down to a planetary surface. And you can watch the whole thing happen, and you get it right away. We won't even have to explain the transporter. We'll just show it. And it'll be coming like a surprise, but they'll, it'll fit. And of course it did. Everybody caught the idea quickly. And so uh, Star Trek was launched on its path. But Star Trek was for me a minor achievement. Although I enjoy the notoriety that it brings, 
It seemed kind of dumb. I knew Gene Roddenberry as a journeyman television writer. Okay, but not brilliant. Uh, his, uh, he had gained the notoriety by writing a story for Wanted, no, for Have Gun Will Travel, in which a school teacher saved some children or some damn thing. I can't remember it. Whatever it was, he won an uh, Emmy. Uh, a award for uh, this episode and that gave him some prestige and so he teamed up with Herbert F. Solo who was in charge of the Desilu Studios and the rest is history but that was just one of many things for me because when you're writing for the glory the glory comes from doing something good from whoa you did that oh my god and so the hardest part of that whole job was getting the job because you had to have an agent, you had to get an appointment, you had to work out a half a dozen ideas for Route 66 and then talk to some story editor who would finally, if you were lucky, say, I like that, yeah, if you can work the kinks out of that, we'll have another meeting. And maybe and the next thing you know, you'd get an assignment based upon a storyline which you had to first tell them in detail, and then you had to write it down in the form of a story or outline, at which time you may or may not get commissioned to write a script based upon that outline. And I made a precarious living doing that by not worrying about the money. Turning it over to the agent. If I get paid, I get paid. If I don't, I don't. But meanwhile, I want to do something really good I think this show, Route 66, I could do something decent within the, that format. Gomer Pyle? No, I cannot write anything of burning significance on the Gomer Pyle show. It is like you sort among all these flavors. Uh, Honey West, a female detective who's got some brass and, and, uh, and is athletic and wonderful actress to play the role. Do you want to do it? Yeah. I'll do a, a crime story with, uh, with a female detective, and I'll do something really lovely about, uh, in this case, uh, drugs that are time dated, and if they aren't sold before a certain date, you got to dispose of them. But if you dispose of them in the right way, you get paid the insurance money that comes from their destruction. And the guy's involved in that kind of a scheme, and here comes Honey West. George, that's a brilliant idea. Yes, go for it. And then I would write it. And in each case, I would wait for that applause from my friends, people like Charles Beaumont and William F. Nolan and Jerry Sowell and Earl Hamner Jr. and a bunch of people who wrote for The Twilight Zone. Beaumont wrote 20, 22 episodes of The Twilight Zone. That's an amazing thing to be able to come up with that many off-the-wall touch of strange ideas. And the only way, reason that I was able to do it was I wanted to be Ray Bradbury. I wanted to be Ray Bradbury. I wish he would die and I could take his place because I understand and approve of what he's doing and I want to learn to do it. So I became a Ray Bradbury forger. And I forged a lot of dandelion wine stories with a touch of strange in them and I sold them to Rod Serling over a period of many years and altogether have eight credits on that show. But I think my most illustrious credit was an episode of Kung Fu that I wrote. David Carradine directed it. It was written about young Kane instead of the old Kane. And instead of having the old Kane flash back to the wonderful days in the temple, we had the young boy in the temple flashing forward to the adventures of this half-crazed uh, Oriental in the Old West, and it was beautiful. It was the same format, but a different formula, or the same formula. I remember when they did that and was like, whoa, what's going on? Yeah, what is this? But it gave Carradine a chance to not have to be on screen all the time, so he could direct his only direction. He could direct my episode. And when I saw what he was doing, I just wanted to cry.
so beautiful. He had Victor Sin Young, who was a young Oriental in movies when I was a growing boy, as an old Mandarin who's dying. And he had a swan brought in and put on this pond. And when you watch this regalia with this swan, just so perfectly poetically wonderful and oriental to the max. Anyway, the real point of, that I'm trying to get at is I work for the glory. I want the fame. I want to be known as the guy who did that. I want to prove I can do anything. I wrote the Rat Pack story. That was the first thing I ever wrote. I sold it. I brazened my way into groups of young writers that I admired by showing them that I had written this script. It took six years from the time I sold it to the time that Frank Sinatra and his Rat Pack showed, appeared on the scene. And during that six years, I used that tattered script. I met William F. Bull and I said, I guess I'm a screenwriter, I wrote this. And he fingers it and doesn't know what the hell to make of it. But after that, I'm not this neophyte nobody. I'm this guy. And this reputation, this ability to get doors opened up, to talk with agents and understand their business and their language, but not to be taken in with it, because I don't believe in money. I think it's a lie. I think you're going to find out that it doesn't work, that you can't really keep track with these credits and debits, because... Fortunately, I do believe in money. See, unfortunately, my wife does too. Fortunately for our family, because I give everything I make to her and let her worry about the numbers. I do not give a rat's ass about any of that. I want the <coughs> glory. I want to be known as the guy who did it. You wrote The Twilight Zone? Oh my God, let me worship at your shrine. Yes, you may, if you don't make a mess. You know? <laughs> I joke, because it is such an important thing to me to not give a damn about money. Money is a trap and a delusion. I've never needed any, and yet I always am in need of it. You never needed any. I own a home in Los Angeles. I have no debts. I've got splendid children. I've got a loving wife just celebrated a 60th birthday with her. I have no problems with society. I'm not a criminal or anything like that. And yet I don't hardly like anything about it, the society. And I can see it changing. And so now I want to tell you my message, if I have one. Things are in the change. I feel in the air, on it prickling my flesh, the same feeling I felt in 1959, when I was slowly emerging from five years of digging dry wells and not selling any of my stories to anybody and wondering, was I crazy to think that I understood literature and stories and had good taste and had smart ideas? Everybody seemed to think I did. But I remember retyping one of my stories 14 times so, so that I'd have a fresh copy to send out to wannabe people. I remember when I sold a story to the magazine of fantasy and science fiction for $30, although it had taken me three or four months and many retypings to get the story correct. The thing is that this change I'm feeling I felt it in 59 and then came the 60s and I got very busy being a TV writer. I feel it today, this 2013 thing, this is the dawn of a new era and it's very in keeping with the era that came with the 60s, which was we learned to think in new categories, the Twilight Zone helped us to do that, and so did student sit-ins and, and uh, uh, children coming from the East Coast to the West Coast. The youth quake, as Time Magazine called that era, of consciousness expansion. Our world went like this. LSD helped. Marijuana helped. Uh, new social conventions helped. Hippies helped. Colorful clothing helped. 
Beatles music helped. Everything that was happening during that period pushed in on a very closed down society in which everybody looked like Richard Nixon, wore a dark colored suit so that you wouldn't think they were working class. It was a period of stultification and stagnation and we had run out of things to talk about and everybody was bored to death and along came this tumultuous wave of new energy sparked a lot by children but eventually it changed the culture to what we now know. Now we're about to do that again. And we've got much more sophisticated drugs and attitudes to deal with. We got a whole world collapsing economically. Big nations are re getting ready to throw in the towel. We're afraid, afraid to approach the fiscal cliff problem. And there's no real damn reason why we should come out of this depression, recession thing, because the odds are very, very good that without some experience in this field, we probably would have just slid slowly over the cliff because of the The point is that change is in the air. Things are not the way they were. The mother doesn't talk to her child the same way she did 10 years ago. The, the schools have been proven to be a fraud. They're dumbifying our kids down. Some people are escaping it, mostly through the internet, the World Wide Web, a, figure, a, a situation in which leaders in all countries are looking at each other, realizing they share the same problems. And that, ultimately, these debts are not going to be paid off. They're going to be washed over and kicked under tables and, and the middle class ownership. That's what constitutes the middle class. If you own a house, you're a member of the middle class. If you own a car, you're not. You're a member of the lower classes or the working poor. And most of us are working poor. Very few of us have the liberty to uh, work for ego boo, which is what science fiction fans have called it for years. Why do those people put out all that energy to put out those fanzines and to review those movies or what they all, they all do? It's for ego boo. It's for acknowledgement from others of their deeds. Because it's my theory not original with me, that a man is his deeds. We measure a guy by what he does. Now we have this thing called self-esteem. I got very high self-esteem. I think a lot of me. I approve a lot of my actions, my thoughts, my behavior. The self-esteem is based upon achievements because most of us, we have a synthetic self-esteem. It's provisional. As long as you hold that job, you're the boss. Lose that job, we're all going to kick your ass. You have no special privileges here, and it's only because you're the head of the company or because you signed the checks or because of this. But if you lose that position, then you're just a poor schlub. You have no distinction whatsoever, you know. But I have distinction whatsoever everywhere I turn because of my deeds, because I wrote Star Trek. I wrote Twilight Zone. I wrote Kung Fu. I wrote Route 66. I met in the course of doing that some of the world-class people that we all look up to as heroes. Movie actors, I've met many a movie actor and I've found out a lot of interesting things. I wrote for Walter Matthau before he became Walter Matthau. I uh, wrote for Robert I mean, uh, Robert, Redford, sure. Robert Redford, before he became Redford. And uh, anyway, the, the point is that that's a good philosophy to write for the fame and the fortune. Because it takes it first out of that grubby game of negotiating for nickels, or especially when you don't believe the goddamn nickels are going to hold out. You take them to the store and you're going to find out that they won't accept them anymore. Because of the fact that the world is becoming enormously poor 
while becoming enormously rich. There's no reason for anybody to be starving. Oh my God, there's no reason in the world for there to be any prisons or jails. I mean, after all, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are inalienable. That means they can't take them away. They can't change them. Rights. Liberty is a right, but the minute you drive your car too fast, you find it taken away from you and you're locked in a box. And being locked in a box is cruel and unusual punishment. I'd rather be flogged than be locked up for 30 days. I tell you, it's just... Jubal Harshaw agrees with you. Hmm? Jubal Harshaw agrees with you. Well, God bless Jubal, because I they say bring black back flogging and get rid of this prison system. It's cruel. It's stupid. It creates criminal classes. It t serves no purpose whatsoever. It's brutal and and uh, functionless. Actually, so, Jubal thinks it's better to die than to be locked in a cage. Same thing with schools, the way we got schools. And I'll tell you the problem. The problem is called jobs. Jobs. To earn a living. Why should you earn a living? You were born on planet Earth. That should give you a ch chunk of it all the way to the center of the Earth. And you should be able to come out and put a, cla a plaque on your piece of land that, that you own by virtue of being born here. And yet you've got to earn a living. That's a very old, archaic idea. Alvin Toffler, in his book Future Shock, tells us that within 20 years, it's only going to require 50,000 living people to run the world. That all the rest of them will be taken up by jobs, by, by machines, and by systems that will provide the food and harvest this, this, and all the stuff we used to need labor for that's going out the window. So what are we going to do? Well, everybody will go on Social Security or its equivalent. It'll be 10 grand a year that you get, that you can get your food and your clothing and your and your uh, raiment and your dwelling place, and that'll be provided. So now you can spend all of your time doing what you want to do. Ray Bradbury says, do what you love doing. Do it enthusiastically. Don't worry about whether it's a job. Don't worry about whether, you know, it's got retirement or any of that. Just go follow your your urge. Your bliss. Your bliss. My urge is to be a storyteller. I, <coughs> I read so many pulp magazines growing up. I lived in books and magazines. I'm self-made. I, I failed the second grade, and they moved me to the... I Actually, I was sick during the second grade, and they put me in the third grade. And I was already confused because I'd learned addition and subtraction in the first grade, and in the second grade, they teach you multiplication and division. But in the third grade, if you go in there without that distinction in your head, it says cross. Doesn't that mean plus? No, you got to get the cross like this, and that's plus. But if you do that to it, it's a different thing altogether. I did not know that. I went at least six months of school in the third grade without understanding why every question I tried to answer I got wrong because I was adding or not uh, subtracting. I learned how to divide with a little diagram you draw and put the numbers in it and then do a certain number of operations and now I can't divide in my own, own head. Simple numbers that I can visualize and see but I've been trained by the school system to think slow and to move it as snail space and to learn things in little tiny chunks. I discovered in my own looking at it that from one to six, they teach you reading, writing, and arithmetic. That's enough for a, for a lifetime. My mother and father both only went to the third grade, but my mother could write a letter. It wasn't an imaginative letter, but it was a letter. My mother could add and subtract, keep track of, of uh, dollars and cents, and uh, Reading, she liked to read. My my whole family read. I read incessantly. Reading, writing, and arithmetic the first six years. Then you go in from the sixth to the ninth. What do they treat you? Reading, writing, arithmetic. Only they call it 
geometry or tri trigonometry, or history. and they call it history or, or social studies or something. But it's still teaching you to extract information from written words. And then from 9 to 12, same game again. And when you go into college, or which I did on the GI Bill for a month or so, and I, they wouldn't let me do what I wanted to do. I wanted to become like Frank Lloyd Wright and be an architect. But they wouldn't let me close to a drafting board. They had me taking geometry again. I understand angles and forces. Well, I can play pool. What are you bothering me for with all this stuff? It's unnecessary, but it's curriculum. And so I found myself a victim of curriculum, and I felt myself slowing down and losing my edge. So one day, I left the college and I never went back. I bought a house on the GI Bill. I've been treated by the Veterans Administration hospitals for my ailments. In every way possible, I'm so grateful that when I was from 17 to 21 years old in the Army, because the rewards I've gotten out of it since that time are totally enormous, and I never had to risk my life. For although I'm a veteran of World War II, I enlisted after the ceasing of hostilities, but before the thing was signed aboard the Missouri and the war was officially over and Hirohito said, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the key thing is that you don't need all that apparatus and crap in order to be very successful in this country if you begin to understand what in the hell is going on. And what is going on right now is the foe, the forces of evil, using economics and the power of money, are trying to, from what I can see, kind of enslave us. To what purpose, I can't imagine, because they don't need us for labor, and I don't think they're going to eat us. I just don't know. The point is that I go for the glory. I would like to become known famous. I like the idea that people know who I am. I like the idea that I'm free to tell people what I have done and gain their respect and oftentimes their admiration because they know it's an exceedingly difficult thing to do, especially if you do it very well. And I do it very well. And every time I turn around, I find a new opportunity. William F. Nolan and I wrote Logan's Run. We did it in 21 days, three weeks in a motel room. It's a staggeringly good book, I have to admit. It's up there with The Stars of My Destination by Alfred Bester, in my opinion, which I think is one of the best science fiction works in the world. And now I can see that they're about to remake Logan's Run if everybody's head is screwed on right. And I look forward to seeing what they do with it. And in the meanwhile, I'm trying to stay miles ahead of all of that stuff. Right now, I'm talking to a director about Twilight Zone, the musical. One story, a play, a full-length play, that it has a lot of stories embedded in it. And I think I've got the damn thing under real tight control. And I wouldn't be too surprised if before long, Somebody with some serious money tries to put Twilight Zone the musical, which I call a tribute to Rod Serling, and Rod Serling's in the play because of the relationship I have with Carol Serling. She said, if the stories are good, it's fine with me. So I'm about to make a big, very serious Broadway musical play out of Rod Serling's visionary concept, the Twilight Zone. And I'm not going to call it the Twilight Zone at all, but it's going to be star Rod, uh, Rod Serling, uh, mostly voiceover throughout the entire story. And it'll consist of many parts. And uh, I could tell you in greater detail what my plans are for it. But the point is that that's just one of 20 properties that I'm dancing around with as I sit here ready to do this or that. I got five books in work, one called Photogenic Fiction, one called uh, Magical Thinking, one called The Ring of Truth, one called Shadow and Substance, one called Jessica's Rock. 
all of them will be published. I have no doubt of that. My, my future is very, very bright from, from where I sit. But again, it's not for the money. My wife and child wish it was different. They wish I would pay some attention to that. But I really can't. It's too silly and trivial for me to make a big deal out of it. I'll, I'll just keep trying to do good work and hope that I get credit for it. And I hope that my name appears bigger and bigger on the goddamn screen. Which, which brings us to our product display, which we'll get to shortly. <laughs> yeah, as a matter of fact, I brought along some stuff that the Johnson boys have been kicking around. Uh, an album called The Fictioneer, where I take some juicy stories and read them out loud. And uh, with sound effects and music supplied by Paul Johnson on the keyboards, etc. Just an amazingly good stuff, I think. And we brought along a full flock of things, including a couple of copies of my book, uh, Writing for the Twilight Zone, Twilight Zone Scripts and Stories. And uh, so, uh, all in all, I hope that if you're interested, you take a look at some of the stuff that's on the table. And uh, you'll never find it any cheaper because we're having a yard sale. <laughs> yeah. George, can you uh, give us an update on what's going on with uh, Icarus, Montclair, <coughs> and Fright? Uh, you, yeah. You previewed uh, the restored version of the movie at uh, Comic Fest. It was very well received, I thought. I did too. I, I thought it was an amazing work because it's a plan that could be executed very easily by a lot of people. In my mind, I call it illustrated radio, because like Paul and I have made several CD albums. But a CD is the soundtrack, and if you could illustrate it, then you have a DVD. So to illustrate these CDs is quite easy to do. I did it with one of them with a product called uh, Your Three Minutes Are Up in which I read a short story with sound effects and music and then d listened to the sound of it and it behaved as I listened to what I was hearing in my workroom with the camera scanning the areas where I hide myself when I'm trying to get something accomplished. And it was quite beautiful little film. So that now this product called uh, Illustrated Radio looms large in my mind, and I'm just about to do one called, uh, called a, I think a bicycle like a flame. Anyway, I have selected out some work that lends itself to being heard as a radio drama, but also to, to be entertained. I'll give you another example of what I'm talking about. Back in the 60s, I was hired by Universal to write a pilot for a series they wanted to do called Frankenstein. They owned Frankenstein. It was still theirs. It hadn't gone into the public domain yet. And they had the Karloff image firmly fixed in everybody's mind. And they decided that they would have a pilot for an hour-long series about this creature that's resurrected in each episode to die miserably in the flames in the end of each episode, or its equivalent. And they asked me to write the pilot, which I did. It's called The Creature's Blood, and it's a story about a scientist who had heard about this immortal creature, the Frankenstein monster, and he knew that the life was in the blood, because that's ancient, ancient lore, that the life is in the blood. So he reasoned that if he could get a sample of the Frankenstein creature's blood, he would be able to discover the secret to immortality. And so I wrote this story. Very interesting thing. But the cost of recreating the atmosphere of the Frankenstein stories is too prohibitive. And I encountered my nemesis, a man named Gene Kuhn. Gene's a writer. He wrote a, 
uh, The War Wagon, among others, a John Wayne picture. Mm -hmm. Very well-known writer, high reputation, given the job several times of being a producer, and each time it was in my case. Like in this case, he says to me, George, it's lovely what you're doing, but I think we should put the Frankenstein monster in New York City. And I said, are you mad, Gene? In New York City, I think he was a wounded war vet. I'd want to slip him a couple of bucks. I don't think I'd be afraid of him, you know. He didn't understand, and I would say, the very fact that this is medieval allows us to suspend our disbelief that the lightning, that this creature lifted up into the lightning, the lightning strobes into this thing's body, and now it's alive again. That's magical, and you're not going to do that in New York City. No one is going to believe it, uh, but they will. Anyway, he had no idea about that. And on another occasion, I uh, wrote a second Star Trek script called Rockabye Baby, in which something is coming from outer space, and the Starship Enterprise tries to avoid it, but it seems to track the ship, and then it hits the ship, and the camera shakes, and everybody is thrown to the floor. And they look around, something they hit the very tiny, coming from very far away, coming very, very fast, hit the ship. What will happen now? All of a sudden, the door begins to open and close, and we hear this sound, wah, 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 and they look at each other, and it's the sound of a human baby. What can this possibly mean? And then they begin to discover what it could possibly mean. So. I had this dilemma of just about ready to go to work on this when Gene Roddenberry steps down from his position as producer and hires Gene Kuhn to step in and take his place. Whereupon Gene, true to form, says to me, you have the voice of the ship as a small boy talking like a small boy and we hear that. But I think, since he's a product of the, of the uh, wiring of the ship more than anything, he would have a more of a vocoder, more of a mechanical quality. And I said, that's fine, logically, but it would destroy the illusion, because the whole illusion is that the ship has become a small boy who admires Captain Kirk and sees him as his father figure, a father. Well, Gene has all of his arguments against my point of view, because he's the boss and he's going to do it. So I say to Gene Rottenberry, look, we worked this out between you and me, and it's been written and rewritten, and now we're going to come and throw it out, because he says, this is insane, Gene. You have a responsibility to me. And Gene says, I know that, but I also have a responsibility to him, and I hired him. And I can't really second guess everything he's doing, so you'll just have to deal with him as best you can. And so I uh, ended up re inheriting my story about the ship coming alive, only to watch the next generation steal ideas from the story because it got into their system, and now everybody knows about George's wannabe story about the baby, the ship that comes alive. So, it's not a pleasant life. It's not always beer and Skittles, as they say, to be a, a person who makes up stuff for television. But I loved it. I'm still as good at it as I ever was. And uh, I watch how TV has changed. And I think everything is NCIS. <clears throat> Everything is NCIS, and uh, every damn show looks alike, and every show deals with the CIA, and every deal, and God, that's boring. Jesus, how, how did they get in the shape they're in for that a guy like me to can't see anything on TV that if I wrote for that show, it would give me ego to it, that it would make me have a sense of, uh, of uh, achievement because I want a sense of achievement out of it. When it's done, I want to tell my friends I did it. And now I'm publishing a book 
of some of those choice scripts called photogenic fiction, and I think legacy-wise, it'll be very, very important document, and I think I'll sell a lot of copies of it. I'm not sure I have the right to do so, but I'm going to do it anyway. Because not to do it is to suffer uh, censorship on the one hand and a loss of legacy on the other. And I want people to know that I did that story and that story and that story. And in each case, when you look at that story, you will concede, I believe, that that's damn good. And we, because that's what I was up to. And I think that I... 83 years later, uh, I look at the internet and I see my name all over it. Thousands and thousands of entries on Google or uh, or Wikipedia or the database. And I didn't put a single one of them on there. So other people out there, for reasons of their own, have compiled and complete histories of my work. and. Uh, in a way, it reassures me that I'm right about this, that this was a good way to do it. Forget about the money. It's a small show. They don't have a big amount of money, but they got a quality product, if you can match their their quality. And I believe that I have. So thank you. Thank you. Who would you say was... Um Favorite uh, writer you like to collaborate with? If there is one. <laughs> That's a no brainer. Gotta be Ray Bradbury. No, I enjoyed working with Bradbury and with, uh, with Serling. I'd worked with uh, Charles Beaumont. I had shared credits with him. With William F. Nolan, I share a very important credit with him. It's such a powerful credit that. He and I are married. I mean, we're going to go to our graves. Nolan Trotz, Nolan Trotz, because that's who we were when we were writing that uh, book. The greatest guy, I'll tell you who I'd love to meet, R. Crumb. If I could meet R. Crumb, I, I'd rather meet him than George Clooney. Truth to tell, it's just, where are you at? Well, for me, Crumb, is one of the greatest comic minds of the century. I don't think there's anything out there at all like him, with his skill, his understanding, and his leadership ability. He's the guy who created Zap Comics. And Zap, as a counterculture product, just was right for the 60s. And to be someone like him who will do this thing for 2013, 2014, 2015, however long it takes, to completely restructure the world because the old system isn't working. It but, is yeah, but that wasn't the question. Uh, 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 uh. Restate the question. Who's your favorite? Who's the, your favorite? Well, I think I think that's what I was figuring you'd probably say, sir. Um, Bradbury certainly. Where were they? I mean, I'm just wondering what that process was like. <coughs> If you could talk a little bit about what the process of collaboration is. Somebody starts the game. Bradbury writes the story, I adapt the story. I write the story, Charles Beaumont adapts the story. Or Rod Serling adapts the story. It starts with the story. Icarus Montgolfier Wright was a short story I read in the magazine of science fiction, and fantasy and science fiction. I thought it was lyrically beautiful. I, it stuck in my brain as I sort of had glimmerings of ideas about it. And then miraculously, at a meeting of the Fictioneers, I met Ray Bradbury. And he'd come up to the bar beside me, and there's Ray Bradbury. So I say, Ray, I read your thing, Icarus. And I think I know how to make a semi-animated cartoon out of it that would knock everybody out and that the people over at UPA would love to look at. And he said, no, no, I don't think so, George. And I said, well, if you'll give me permission to, I'll write a script and try and show you what I'm doing. And he said, well, go do that. But here's my advice. Write one page a day. 
at the end of the day, before you put your typewriter away, write one page. At the end of 30 days, you'll have 30 pages. So I said, thank you, Ray, thank you, thank you. And then I went home and I wrote that script that night. I was up all night scrabbling around trying to t turn his very lyrical poem into a drama. And I found that I, was, I could do it. And I was hope that an artist would recognize what I was trying to do here and would take up the slack. So I went to my friend Bert Schockberg and asked him would he want to do it, and he wanted to. So I took him to Joe Mignani's house, who was Ray Bradbury's illustrator and who was head of the art department at Otis Art Institute in L.A. And Joe wanted to do it. And of course, it was Ray's story and my adaptation. And I feel the story's got the clout. So I let Ray call the shots without any discussion or argument. Poor Bert felt pretty left out because he never really got a chance to, compert, to compete to do the artwork for that show. But the script worked beautifully. Magnani worked for two years on it. First he made 3,000 sketches about this big, out of which we scattered them around on the floor and then walked around over them, picking out shots so that the 3,000 became 100 drawings, cells, this big. And uh, Joe did all that work over a period of two years. And format films, who immediately saw what we were doing and wanted to play, spent $14,000, doesn't seem like a large amount these days, to get all that work done, to rent that space, to buy the paper, the paints, the inks, and to do all the printing, the camera work that was necessary. But when I saw what they had done with it, I was just overwhelmed. And I knew an art form, a new art form, had been devised here, which was a way of illustrating what are basically radio things. Sound effects is a completely separate thing from what you see on the screen. And so, this thing about the Frankenstein creature, my plan on that is to read that outline, bring in an artist or two who like to draw Carla or who like to draw Schoenberg, who can see what what this thing should look like, and then we'll do the artwork, which could take a year or more. And all those people have to be able to do it for the glory too, because there's no money to pay anybody for the longest time when you're undertaking to make a movie or some kind of a drama like that. So you need people who, are, who really want to do it for the sheer love of doing it and having their names attached to it. And I think I can get an awful lot of people that I know to work on a project if I could guarantee them screen credit, because that's the holy grail. Back when I was writing The Twilight Zone, your name came on the screen for eight seconds. That was contractual, so that your name would be there. And eight seconds is a long time. And people can see your name, and after a while they become, oh, he's him, he's him. Oh yeah, he did that, he did that. Today, it's two seconds. That's rolling from the bottom of the screen up to the top. That quick, your name is in motion and gone within two seconds. So faster. Yeah, it does yeah, seem to me. Excuse me, can I ask you a question? Buck Helton and Rod Sterling were both involved in Twilight Zone. What did they do exactly different? What did one do and what did the other? My dad talked about this for years, and I'm, I'm wondering if I'm mixing up the story, because we used to live next door to Rod so. <laughs> What was the story you heard? That either Buck Houghton or Rod Serling were between, um, between assignments and feeling kind of down, and my dad said, why don't you do something with science fiction? <laughs> the next thing that happened was the Twilight Zone. That could be. I know that... Uh... Buck Houghton was, was a perfect match for Rod Serling. The two were in perfect sync. I spent much more time talking to Buck 
than I did to Rod. But if Buck said it was a deal, Rod would back him up. So that I had a real sense that the two of them knew exactly what they were doing. Buck was a producer and Rod was a creative artist and uh, architect that uh, organized it all. My sense of it, Dad, was that, and uh, I think you know and told me this too, back in, in, in the day when uh, the Twilight Zone was, uh, before it was concepted, uh, Rod wanted to come out with uh, a socially conscious a television series that dealt with issues of the day, but there was lots of taboo subjects, racism. Uh, anyway, you, you can imagine the, the gamut if it would run. Yeah. So the idea was if you put it in terms of fantasy or science fiction, that you could say the same kinds of things, but it wouldn't. There would be a, a step away from the reality. That's what Star Trek was about too. The mo- yeah, yeah, the moment. So and it could be a story it. about discrimination against robots, but we would all know that they're talking about the racial situation. And so Rod was very smart to do it that way. Mm-hmm. I have to agree that that format allowed him to talk about anything and get away with it. Uh, the creature that you're envisioning for this Frankenstein thing that you're working on, how do you see the creature? What sort of mental development, that sort of thing? Uh, <laughs> I've always seen him as a victim Okay. when I saw the original. He's simple-minded. He doesn't know that he, that you can't kill people or that, that if you treat him too rough, they'll die. He's a very simple person. Why, why but that basically you? he's a human. He loves laughter. He, he, uh... So in doing it, I, I would strive to get that Karloff feeling of menace and awkwardness and confusion that the poor creature feels most of the time because he's the prize people he's the one that's being victimized in most of the stories that I thought about for use in this but I also for example uh, you got King Kong which is a circus master wants to display the great ape right a circus master wants to display the Frankenstein creature and you have an episode the Hound of the Baskervilles the creature makes friends with a vicious, strange dog that's a total menace to everybody that won't let people mess with the creature, you know. And it's another episode. So I, I made up a series of proposed storylines that would allow them to gain a perspective on what I thought was the <coughs> essence of this story about a person made up of spare parts, an arm from this one, a jeweler's hand here, a blacksmith's hand here. And when it finally comes, becomes aware, it's completely freaked, completely screwed up. It's lifted up into the lightning, the lightning brings it to life. They lower it down, the birth, we've all seen it in the movies. And that's like at the beginning of each episode. There's the creature being made out of uh, old uh, body parts. Well, what I'm thinking here is, is that, that I, I, I know you've got, uh, I guess what I'm asking is, is the level of mental development, because you've, in, the, in the Todd Browning, uh, not, well, in the Frankenstein, so in Franken, the first Frankenstein. Of, the Mary Shelley? Uh, yeah, well, well the, the two ones, and when you look at, at Mary Shelley, the creature there is somewhat more Elevated mentally, a little yeah, bit. Yeah. It's, it's a yeah. more. He's a poet. Yeah, and that whole sort the of modern thing. Prometheus. Yeah, and that sort of thing. <laughs> and then on the other hand, on the uh, on, on, on the, the the film Frankenstein, he's uh, well, but basically kind of retarded sort of, of creature on there. And I'm, I'm you're looking at him as somewhere in your your view is somewhat something between this, uh-huh. or, or what level mentally would this creature be? It's a good question because I have something in this story that deals with it. Because the person wakes up wondering, what is this? He cannot conceive. He can remember being dumped into a cell. He can remember this, he can remember that, various parts of it. And uh, so my poor vision of it really was uh, that... He's, by the time 
the birth is over. Mm -hmm. He's half mad, and he's allowing himself to be led through the castle. They take him up to a mirror and let him see himself in the mirror. Ah! The creature, as I remember him from the movies, is a very, in a way, sympathetic, but a tormented mm -hmm. person, you know, not... Well, remember, he had the brain of a killer. Uh, that's what they... In the movies, yeah, in the movie. Oh, he... No, because if I recall, yeah. if I recall Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, oh, yeah. uh, they, they, first of all, they don't really go into at all how the creature was created. None of the electricity and all that kind of stuff. That was all the movies that did that. But he becomes kind of, kind of like a genius, really. In the, in yeah, he's Mary a poet. Uh, uh, yeah, and, and then, he and goes then, out on the ice uh, and becomes a... God knows what. Well, well yeah, well, the, the fact... Well, he falls in with some revolutionaries also. And, I mean, this is, you know, 1800. 1830 or so on that. Oh, and and, 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 and then, they, then they did uh, when a, another a film, Frankenstein, based much more on the Mary Shelley thing, came out. Uh, he's actually even a, a fairly handsome young man. Well, actually a handsome yeah. young man. And they actually uh, get, you know, teach him some of the social graces. And, and the he whole dresses sort of thing. nicely. Yeah, and the whole sort of thing on that. So very, you know, you got the whole Well, I'm taken ones. by the American film. Okay. Because it scared the hell out of me when I was a boy. <laughs> yeah. In fact, my two favorite films are Frankenstein and Pinocchio. Pinocchio wants to be a real boy, and so do I. You know? Okay. I, my conscience is about all I have to guide me. What do I, how would I want others to behave toward me? If you were to, to decide or just think about going, to, for example, doing uh, something, uh, you're doing Frank on Dracula, how would you, how would you, you, you uh, I don't know if you ever consider them, but how would you, you, you put the Dracula character? I'm not sympathetic to Dracula. Okay. The whole idea of vampires is parasite. You know, I'm not, he's not my hero. Okay. <laughs> uh, Bela Lugosi made a good living off of that idea. And Pori Ackerman made an even better living off of Bela Lugosi. Okay, yeah. You're familiar with Pori, aren't you? No, not with him, no, I'm not. He is the most remarkable man, a collector, who had a house full, well, he had a shelf. Okay, oh, is that oh no, Ackerman. Okay, now I, yeah, I say I'm a Bill Hauser. Bill Hauser interviewed. Yeah, the, 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 yes, he did. Yes, now, 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 yeah, yeah, he was the yeah, big, uh, yeah. the guy who his whole house was crammed with everything on that everything, science fiction everything. and everything. Yeah, total a collector. Yeah, he even had the creature from Metropolis, uh, the robot uh -huh. woman. He had it all. He had the seven pieces of Doctor Lau. Yeah. Me and my crowd crowned him king of the fans and spent $300 for his crown, telling fans that if they wanted to have a different king of the fans, they got to spend more than $300 to crown him. So. Okay, Jay, bring up the guy you really want to bring up, H.P. Lovecraft. <laughs> no, actually, I wasn't planning on bringing him up, but, there's, but now since you brought up H.P. Lovecraft, uh, I, no, I personally, I, I, I think what the H.P. Lovecraft uh, Historical Society has done with the two films they turned out was actually really, really good. Uh, both, both the Paul of Chalupu and uh, the Whisper in the Darkness, I thought would turn out to be really, really well done films and everything. I like them a lot. I, why? Uh, what, you want me to ask them? No, no. Do I, something I, I, with H.P. Lovecraft? I, I, no, I was just... Uh, okay. Some people came to me and gave me a thousand dollars to figure out where this story was in Lovecraft. And they had these books, you know, uh, Mountains of Madness and all yeah. that stuff. And they didn't know which ones to do. They were sympathetic toward the ones about the character named Randolph, mm -hmm. who's a young man in several of the stories. Mm -hmm. and, but they said to me, where is the story in this thing? And it's a hell of a story. This group of people that he belonged to, antiquarian types, many of them were printers, and uh, they would meet, and uh, their subject was uh, Lovecraft's inventions. Lovecraft was writing, and these people were helping him to get his stories published. And uh, anyway, I saw a situation in which a young man named Barlow 
was a fan of, of HPs and came and hung out with HP. And HP was a very promising guy and one suspects some homosexual relationship between these two people. Mm -hmm. Then there's this lady named Sonia who was married to Lovecraft mm -hmm. for several years. She ran a store, millinery or something, and uh, was very dominant kind of a person and actually donated 50 bucks to this uh, society that uh, Lovecraft was the president of, which was the United Amateur Press Association, which was the first big APA, mm -hmm. Amateur Press Association. And uh, Lovecraft was the president of it. And she was happy to help to support.